Bienvenidos a Habana. My name is Derek Gallagher and I'm here with my friend Peter Horn and you're listening to the Point of Learning podcast. On today's show, Cuba. It is a free education and free health care for everyone. It doesn't matter if they are black or white. It doesn't matter if they are poor or they belong to the middle class or some people that they have a good living. It is for everyone. We'll also touch on the Cuban Literacy Campaign of 1961, in which 250,000 volunteers, many of them children, taught basic literacy skills to over 700,000 people in less than one year. They carried out a literacy campaign. They went to the different areas here in Cuba, like to the countryside areas, where people, they didn't have a school, and the goal was to teach people how to read and how to write as well. On our last night in Havana, this past January, Robin and I were enjoying the view from the Malacón, the beautiful esplanade and seawall that stretches for about five miles along the coast. The Malacón is also a roadway, which is important because about 10 minutes after we sat down to gaze at the water and sip some rum, we heard skidding, a crash. We spun around to see that a car had collided with a turning motorcycle. Crossing the roadway carefully to try to help we were struck that nearly everyone else did, too. The driver of the car that hit the motorcycle stopped. Other pedestrians stepped in to help the motorcyclist to his feet slowly, to collect his watch and helmet, to direct traffic, to summon police. Almost immediately, another car stopped, offering to bring the injured man to the hospital. He got in with his belongings, and the car sped away. Other citizens waited a few minutes for the police to arrive, made sure no one touched the damaged bike, and volunteered their report. If this had happened our first night in Havana, I don't know that we would have made so much of it. But after almost 10 days in Cuba, Robin and I thought the strong sense of interconnectedness and shared struggle in these people's response to the misfortune of a stranger encapsulated so much of what impressed us over and over again during our brief stay in the country. Yes, like U.S. history, the history of Cuba is complicated. And I'm not with this episode attempting to gloss over its harder moments. But I do want to showcase a couple remarkable facets, like the jaw-dropping success of Cuba's national literacy campaign of 1961 that were news to me, especially because we're at a moment in the U.S. where people are starting to say socialism with a straight face. It's true that not many people in Cuba are very wealthy, which some North Americans find troubling, sure. But I tell you, in our visits to cities and towns in different parts of the island, I counted fewer than 10 homeless people during our entire stay. Here's how Education Minister Jose Ramon Fernandez explained it to Jonathan Kozel in the 1970s. He said that great emphasis is placed on rural clinics, infant health, and prenatal care. Quote, In Cuba, the store windows may not seem to be so full as in Chicago or Caracas or San Juan, but there are no children hungry, no children sick without physicians present, nor are there school children without schools. Close quote. Also, for what it's worth, when Robin and I traveled in January 2019, the government of Cuba was open for business and its TSA agents were being paid. The U.S. government... Not so much. So Cuba is a country I've been curious about for a long time. Only 90 miles away from the U.S., but so thoroughly isolated by our foreign policy. As a child of the 70s and 80s, I of course grew up during the Cold War. I knew that Cuba was allied with the Soviet Union, 
that there had been some kind of missile crisis when Kennedy was president, and that Fidel Castro seemed like he would never die, despite all those cigars. It wasn't so much that I learned a bunch of false information about Cuba in school. It's just that Cuba didn't come up all that much. We learned a little about the Spanish-American War. We remembered the Maine. We touched on the Revolution of 1959, but that was about it. It was really only when I got the chance to visit the country that I became totally fascinated. That's right, you guys. I found myself at the point of learning. Our tour guide for the show today is Yana Cruzata Quintero, who, in fact, was Robbins and my tour guide for most of our visit to Cuba, leading our small but intrepid group of three Australians, two Irish, one Scotsman, that's Derek, whom you heard at the top of the show, and us two Yankees. Yana kept us oriented and informed as we explored Havana, Vinales, Cienfuegos, and Trinidad. Yana has an impressive command of history and was eager to show us Cuban culture from the inside, setting us up as guests in Casas Particulares, which would be like a Cuban Airbnb, except that your hosts are also staying on the premises and they actually cook you breakfast. A product of Cuba's remarkable and totally free school system, Jana repaid her country's investment in her by serving three years as an English instructor for professionals wishing to learn the language later in life. This kind of schooling is also free for Cubans. I began by asking Jana to state the most important things she'd like non-Cubans, especially U.S. citizens, to understand about Cuba. Yes, I was telling you, education and the health system, they were the main priorities when the revolution triumphed. Because before that, people, they didn't, they were not allowed to study or or have any access to school or the health care. I think it is very important that people, they know that uh, once the revolution triumphed, people in Cuba, they were considered like persons, we can say, that because before that, I think uh, people, they were, I mean, the poor people, they were considered like nothing because they didn't have any rights or anything. So I think it is important that people, they know that education and health, they, they are the main priorities here in Cuba, so everyone has access to them. It is a free education and free health care for everyone. It doesn't matter if they are black or white. It doesn't matter if they are poor or they belong to the middle class or some people that they have a good living. It is for everyone. And in some countries, there is free guaranteed education up until the eighth grade, say, you know, eight or nine years of school that is free. And you're saying it is through college. Yeah, here in Cuba, it is, education is free until university. I mean, that is the last point. Yeah, uh, so we don't have to pay anything, not even when, when we are at the university. Um, because the government, they provide everything for you. So even though you are from the country area, you can go to a university that it is not so close to the place you are from, and they will provide uh, a place for you to stay, they will provide food for you, and you wouldn't have to pay anything. And you are paid as well. Just for going to the university, you are paid here in Cuba. I mean, it is not a lot, a lot sure. of amount of money, but when I was at the university, you know, I am from Barcoa, and I was studying, yes, on the east of the island, almost the end of Cuba, and I went to the university in Santiago de Cuba, which is about 248 kilometers from my place, and so I had a campus there, I had um, uh, the place where to eat as well, and the we were also paid. I mean, it was not a lot of money. It was only like two or three cooks. So like two or three dollars US. But it was like, we was that a little bit to eat something when the food was not so good. And yeah, but it is free. Um, and the payment back, I mean, once you get graduated, the payment back to the government is to work three years in the place that they need you. And it has to be in the place where you are from. Okay. So when I finish 
university I went to Warakoa, I went back to Warakoa, so I was working uh, as an English teacher at the university there. So there is a small department of the main university that is in Guantanamo province, that is the place that Warakoa belongs to. And yeah, so I was working there for three years. Uh, you were, you were and English I was, teacher, to, teaching what level of uh, students? There, the university there, it is uh, for people that they are already professionals. Okay. But they want to study another major, so it is also one of the opportunities that the government they give people. So once they are already professional, for example, you could be a... Um, a teacher or you could be a lawyer but if you want to study another major the government as well they give you this opportunity they have these universities that people they study uh, on Saturdays mainly mm -hmm. because it is the day that the people they don't have to go to work mainly sure. so they I was teaching there are the people they were like different ages so I had the ones that they were 30 but there were other ones that they were 40 50s so it is for people that they are already professionals and they want to study something else. So they go to that, uni that university and yes, that was what I was teaching. And they also are not paying for this course? No, they or? don't have to pay neither okay. for that. So that's yeah. additional training that they're yeah, getting. Yeah. Wow. As somebody still paying off school loans, I wanted to follow up on a couple things. You said you were working while you were in school? You, were, you had a job on campus? No, no, no. 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 In no. Cuba, that was not, that's, there, no. that's so not the a job problem. comes afterwards. Yeah. And when you said two to three cook, which is two to three dollars, let's say. Yeah. That was like a month? That was a, a month, month, a month yeah. that you were getting. I mean, that was like almost nothing. But, well, almost uh, nothing, but of course, in yeah. the United States, you're paying thousands, many students are paying thousands of, or taking on thousands and thousands of dollars of debt per month. So, yeah, that's, but that's, what, what, I would take, that's what I mean I as well. Take a few Even dollars. though yeah. we don't have to pay anything, we were paid as well. Cool. That was almost nothing, but uh, it helped us a lot. <laughs> yeah. Sidebar. Haven't done one of these in a while, but I thought a sidebar might be the best format to gush a minute about the Cuban literacy campaign of 1961. Especially the parts that Jana inspired me to learn after I returned to the U.S. I'm not sure I'd even heard about the Cuban literacy campaign before traveling to Cuba and reading up a little. And the thing about that is it remains the most successful literacy campaign in the history of, you know, Earth. A little context so everybody's on the same page. A decade earlier, Fidel Castro, who was then a lawyer and charismatic speaker in his mid-twenties, was slated to be a candidate in the 1952 elections. One small problem, those elections were canceled by Fulgencio Batista, a former army official who believed that he was going to lose in the elections, so he staged a military coup in order to establish himself dictator. Castro and his inner circle soon determined that armed revolution was the only viable route. Clipping many interesting stories because I'm trying to get to the literacy campaign. After th several thwarted attempts, the revolution formally triumphs on January 1st, 1959, when Batista flees with oodles of loot to the Dominican Republic by private jet. Fast forward to September of 1960. Fidel is addressing the United Nations in New York City for the first time. There are great stories about this visit, too, but I'm keeping my eye on the prize here. And pledges that Cuba will essentially eradicate illiteracy throughout the population in the coming year. He promises before the world that the roughly one quarter of the human population, nearly one million people who could not read and write, would be able to by the end of 1961. Now, this would be a bold claim even if careful preparations were already in place with his education ministry back home. By all accounts, however, they too were taken by surprise. Fidel understood the link between massive unemployment and rampant illiteracy, which was prime motivation for change. On a personal level, too, Fidel himself was a voracious reader who spent hours every day with books. I can't resist adding that Castro was apparently so talented and focused a reader that none other than Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 
the Colombian prize-winning novelist, would, by the end of his career, send each of his manuscripts to his friend Fidel for proofreading and fact-checking. Okay, big picture, though. Castro believed that a literacy campaign could connect the experience of the more literate city folk and largely illiterate campesinos in the country. That's what he pledged to do, and many, many Cubans joined in the effort. They carried out a literacy campaign. They went to the different areas here in Cuba, like to the countryside areas, where people, they didn't have a school. They went to, to places that there was nothing there. And uh, so they used a method to to teach the people living there. It was like, a, I mean, to teach them the basic stuff. And the goal was to yeah. teach people okay. how to read gotcha. and how to write as well. Broad overview goes like this. In one year, 1961, which also included major interruptions like the CIA-sponsored Bay of Pigs invasion in April, 250,000 volunteers taught 700,000 people how to read and write. Functional illiteracy dropped from about 24% before the revolution to about 4% by the end of 1961. Of those 250,000 volunteers, 100,000 were children, about 40,000 between 10 and 14 years old about 47,000 aged 15 to 17. Like the other volunteers, these kids moved from the city to go and live for a year with rural families, working alongside them in the fields during the daytime and teaching them how to read and write at night and on the weekends. This is amazing to me. First, there's the practical matter that Fidel had to, of course, promise parents that their children would be safe which in large measure they were. Second, Fidel treated these young people and the farmers they were going to be working with like full, equal citizens. Speaking to young volunteers about agricultural products, he said, quote, the nation does not have these goods available because they fell out of the sky. Later, they are the product of the labor of the people. He said, you are going to work for those, meaning the campesinos, the farmers, who up to now have worked for you, close quote. Castro believed the Cuban children could do it, and they did. Today in the U.S. and around the world, about the only positive things that can be said about gun violence and climate change are the ways that young people are stepping up to lead in the case of Parkland students or students organizing on the south side of Chicago or the students around the world who walked out of schools on March 15th to call for action on the climate crisis, these kids are stepping up because we adults are not. In Cuba, on the other hand, the adults in the new government and in the new schools were sending the message that the revolution needs you. You are part of this. Okay. Also, and this fact bears emphasis not just because I'm making this show at the end of Women's History Month, over 50% of the volunteers were female. During the Batista regime, the principal occupations available to women had been housewife and prostitute. After the revolution, women could assume equally important roles. There's a 2011 documentary by Catherine Murphy called Maestra, which focuses on some of the women who participated in the campaign as 14 and 15 year olds, their struggles to convince their parents, and the growth in their self esteem in doing something they believed was so important. For example, the immense satisfaction of teaching an old farmer for the first time in his life how to make the letters that spelled his name. As one woman, 58 years old, when she told her story, put it, quote, to this day, I have experienced no single thing so enormously powerful, end quote. Unlike the U.S., Cuba is a country where equality between men and women is written into law. A volunteer named Maria told Jonathan Kozel in the 1970s, quote, The literacy struggle was the first time in my life, and I believe the first time in our history as well, 
that women were given an equal role with men in bringing about a monumental change. Today we speak of the new woman and new man. It is a phrase that came into common use only in recent years, but it began to be a concrete truth in 1961. Close quote. You doubtless sense there's more I want to tell you, but you get the idea. The more I learn about the literacy campaign, the more I think there are lessons not just for educators, but for anyone else who takes our future, that is to say young people, seriously. For more on this subject, check out Jonathan Kozel's fascinating 1978 account based on his own reporting. It's called Children of the Revolution, A Yankee Teacher in the Cuban Schools. I learned about this book only after returning to the U.S. and beginning to poke around. This is not the first time that I've gotten fired up about an idea and found out that Jonathan Kozel was thinking about it 40 years earlier. All right, back to Janya for some final thoughts. So part of what uh, I, I tried to do with this podcast is to honor the vocation of teaching. And I wonder if there is a teacher uh, in your life, a teacher who made a significant impact on you um, that you want to Uh, talk about? Yes, there are a few. Okay. But yeah, I'm going to talk about one that it was in secondary school. Okay. So in secondary school, I was only like 13 years old, 14. But um, it was my Spanish teacher. Okay. Yeah, I really liked the Spanish uh, language. So we do like a Spanish at a school and this teacher she was like so good at it and she the method she used like for us to learn was like really good so everyone could um, understand everything like really easy her name was Maria Eugenia yeah but um, but she was like really nice um, yeah that also helped me to to try to understand what I wanted to do. What was different for you about her class than she was? Yeah, we can say that she was like very approachable. Had. Okay. We she also was like because here in Cuba we have uh, I mean like different teachers that they are the ones they teach you uh, mathematics. We have a teacher for history or Spanish, so it is not the same teacher. Gotcha. It is a different teacher. So she was the one that, um, she was like the main teacher of our group. Okay. Because every group, they have like a main teacher. So that he's the one that, in case you are not doing so well, he's the one that, uh, or she, in that case, she was the one that she was gonna go to your house. If you were, if you were not going to school, she was gonna go to your house and see what was wow. happening okay. to you. She really cared about us. I remember there was a kid, there, there was this guy, that his family, they were like really, really poor. And I remember he was once operated. I don't know if this is yeah. like that. But uh, she was encouraging us to go to his house, take him some stuff. And so we went there, we visited him, and we took them like some, I mean, some food and some things that maybe he could need because his family, they could not afford to buy anything for him. So she was not only a teacher of that subject, but she was also also teaching us to treat people well, to consider people important as well, to care about people as well. So that's... That's why she was like really, I think everyone in our group, they really remember her. Yeah, and we're still in contact with her because, yeah, she was not only a teacher of Spanish, like Spanish language, but she was also a teacher for all the things in life that happen in life. So it is like... question came up at lunch because so many Cubans, uh, I mean, because music is such a big part of the culture. Is music also part of the formal education or are people who 
you, you, you know, so now, like in school, would music be a subject in school for young people, or is it something if people come to be musicians, is that something they usually get through the family or do on their own? So in Cuba, we have, um, yeah, we have a subject when we are, but that's in secondary school. What oh, secondary? Yeah. So, like high school. so secondary mm -hmm. school, it is like when you are twelve mm -hmm. to fifteen, yeah. approximately. So we do have this subject that is called music education but we don't really get that much yeah, yeah. it is that's like similar, it's similar to the u.s yeah so it you is, might have a you might have like an ensemble at school Would yeah so like the a, ones a in cuba that they want to study that they really like music or they are good at it in cuba we have some schools that they are for that as well so since you are like six years old you go to that school. So see, if your parents, they say that you are like good at music or you have the rhythm or you have the, I mean, your yeah. earring is like really good. Mm -hmm. they, um, they do a test in that school and you can go to this school that is special for that. Okay. You get some other subjects. I mean, you get all the other subjects like mathematics, uh, history and that, mm -hmm. but you are specialized in music so you get like that but yes like music it is like you know that in, i think it is like the blood of every cuban that's why it is like you don't start it or you don't it happens the same with uh with dancing in cuba we don't get like any dancing lessons yeah it is just that like you pick it up uh when you go to school that they do like parties at the school and you just pick it up so it is in the cuban blood mm -hmm. That's it for today's show. My great thanks to Janja Cruzata Quintero for taking time to speak with us. Into other conversations with card-carrying communists, check out episode 11 of my talk with Oscar Eustace. The Cuban music you heard on this episode comes from two bands Robin and I saw in Havana, Maguey and Novel Sam. Thanks to Schaefer James for intro, outro, and sidebar musics. If you haven't yet heard Schaefer's new album, Hope and a Hand Grenade, be about that. Details on that and much more at SchaeferJames.com. Thanks finally to you for your curiosity and your support of this show. I appreciate your subscribing, rating, and reviewing because that really does help other people find us. If you know just one other person who might dig it, please let them know because it will mean most coming from you. Point of Learning is written, recorded, edited, and mixed by me and it's produced in sunny Buffalo, New York. Back in a few weeks to unpack white privilege with Dr. Peggy McIntosh. Are you having fun so far? Is it yes, good? I okay, am. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, New York. New York. <laughs> 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 <laughs>